So now we're going to move into some of the exciting stuff of this presentation, the actual actionable things um, of this presentation. This is just an actual extra resource um, that you can use um, to go along with what you're doing in B3. So we'll talk about implementing best management practices, which are specific methods that have been proven effective and practical for reducing energy use. Um, for this, we'll uh, first gain some perspective um, on what, how electricity is used in Minnesota to help us kind of prioritize uh, some, of our, um, some of our actions. Then we'll uh, talk about the immediate and easy things that you can do um, at the very beginning of your um, management strategies. You can, uh, we'll talk about um, evaluating the building and then um, move into the actionable items of the low cost, no cost efficiency practices. Then um, we'll talk about the longer term and more effort uh, uh, investments. We'll look at um, building performance evaluations, of course, that are more in depth and more involved. Um, and then talk about some capital improvement um, options. Uh, I wanted to point out that major investment is always the last step. There are several things that you can do in order to manage your energy that don't take a lot of um, capital. So. We'll um, address that at the very begin, uh, very end. And then uh, we'll wrap it up with a nice review. So first, the Minnesota electricity pie. I'll ask a question um, that I'd like to, you to think about. What sectors consume the most energy in Minnesota? In the industry, transportation, or buildings? Well, since the majority of this presentation has um, been covering building management, <laughs> you may uh, think that buildings uh, contribute to the highest uh, energy consumption in Minnesota. And you would be right. Um, they, they account for 39% of the electricity use in the state. Now if we break that down between residential and commercial buildings, uh, what do you think? Which, uh, how is the energy in those buildings um, consumed? Are they consumed in the same ways or different ways? Um, do residential buildings um, consume more of their energy in terms of heating and cooling or do they, or, um, versus commercial buildings? Um, where does the energy go in those two sectors? Well, it's actually very different. In residential buildings, heating um, accounts for the greatest um, uh, proportion of the electrical use. Um, and that's partially due uh, because of the high uh, surface area to volume relationship compared to commercial buildings which have a high volume to small surface area. Um, so they don't uh, lose as much heat as, as quickly. Um, and for the commercial buildings, lighting actually takes up the greatest percentage uh, or greatest proportion of electricity use, followed by then heating and cooling. But I'd like uh, to also point out that um, office equipment and refrigerator, re refrigeration and computing all take up a, a significant portion of the electricity usage. And these are all things that can easily um, be tackled um, through low cost, no cost measures. So now that you've gained some perspective, we'll walk through some of the immediate and easy things that you can start doing. Um, First, you need to set a measure, make a measurement um, because you can't manage what you don't measure. So we're going to do a walkthrough or a tour of the building um, during operational, um, different operational periods. So it's good to look at a building when it's um, during, it, during business hours, during after hours, and during special events to notice how the building is being used, how energy is being used, and what for. Um, when you do this, take note of the following. Um, look at the lighting. Um, are, is lighting being left on in places? Is, are areas too bright or areas too dim? Are, is there lighting on near windows, near daylighting? Are those, um, are those uh, light, is that lighting necessary? Um, those are good things to, good questions to ask yourself. Then take a look at the electronic equipment. What electronic equipment is on and around? How often is, is it used? Is th that equipment on, left on all of the time? Um, those are also questions to ask yourself. Uh, take note of the temperature and humidity of all sections of your building. Are areas of the building comfortable or uncomfortable? Are they too hot, too cold, 
could they um, could people wear sweaters instead of um, instead of sitting in 75 degree wet, um, rooms in the winter time um, those are um, important measures or things to take note of um, because it can uh, uh, indicate whether or not your HVAC systems are, are working correctly. Then um, taking a tour of the building is also just good for um, no, regular building management to notice if there's any building damage um, around. If, for example, a stick has fallen through your roof, um, as my father and I noticed when we went into our attic just on a random day and noticed there was daylight coming through and realized a stick had penetrated our roof. Uh, that type of building damage is, is good to notice very quickly because um, the water damage and other things can, um, can spiral on from there. Um, although this is not a tour isn't necessary for this, it is good to evaluate your staff expertise and knowledge um, because those things um, can, you can use that for uh, addressing many of the uh, energy efficiency and energy conservation issues that you have in the building. Um, and that you can, may have opportunities to expand upon that, um, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, some pros and cons of this type of evaluation are that um, it's great that it's self-guided. You can do it whenever you want. It's very low cost. Um, um, and you can spot many uh, low cost opportunities with this type of evaluation. The only con is that you may miss some, miss some technical opportunities. Um, but you can get to those later, and uh, you'll have several things to do before that, um, before you get to that step. So some actual things that you can do. Um, we'll first address lighting, which is a no, uh, there are several no cost things you can do with lighting. First thing is to, of course, turn it off when it's not in use. Um, I know at the, at the U of M, uh, they have these uh, little green stickers around many of the light switches that remind people to turn the, off the lights. Uh, a lot of times, it's just a habit. People don't remember to turn off lights when they walk outside of, out of the room. So providing little prompts and reminders um, is a nice, gentle way to, for people, to remind people to do that. Another thing is to maximize daylighting whenever you can. Many buildings have great, fantastic windows, and it's almost silly to, um, to have lights right next to windows with the shades pulled down. So you can rearrange uh, um, the furniture in rooms to maximize on that daylighting and reduce the amount of fluorescent lighting that you need, um, and then also with the mi mindset of minimizing glare um, to make uh, individuals comfortable, of course. Uh, another. Uh, Option is to delamp. Um, you may want to evaluate how much lighting individuals actually need, and um, and then remove any unnecessary lamps. Um, I know at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, they went around to each individual cubicle and asked people, you know, is this too much lighting? How much lighting do you need? And they were able to delamp in a couple of areas. As far as low cost opportunities for lighting go. Um, you may consider some automatic controls, um, such as occupancy, occupancy sensors in little used areas, like hallways, uh, closets, and, and other occasional used areas. Um, you may uh, investigate some light sensors for lamps that are near windows um, that detect when there's enough sunlight coming in um, that, so that they turn off themselves. Um, and then when it's cl too cloudy or when it's nighttime, then they turn themselves back on. Um, so you save energy that way too. Um, and installation and labor may actually, I mean, cost a couple hundred do of dollars to put such sensors in, but they can cost, uh, cut the cost of energy in those areas by, by half, according to the Metro Certs um, restaurant energy efficiency, uh, energy auditor auditors. Um, another great opportunity are LED, uh, LEDs in exit signs. Um, when, with exit signs, they must always be on. So you want to have the most efficient lighting in those um, in those fixtures as possible. Um, and by using only LED bulbs, one can reduce the energy needed to light the signs by 88%, or save and save $92 um, per year um, for each fixture. That's a lot, and it's a pretty simple fix. Uh, as far as research, extra resources go for um, this topic, there are three really good ones that I know of. The One Stop Energy Shop um, by the uh, Center for Energy and the Environment. 
um, is a great one, as well as Excel's Energy or Efficiency Library. And then the Department of Energy also has a great um, Energy Savers Lighting uh, section on their site. Moving on to the building envelope. Um, in older buildings especially, any orifice, such as a door, a window, or etc., um, has the potential to allow for energy flow uh, and airflow. Um, and it's fairly simple to stop those energy leaks with simple things such as door uh, sweeps, rope caulking, and um, caulking in the actual caulk for cracks. Um, I've actually been kind of amazed at some of the um, the uh, doors around the University of Minnesota that I can put up my hand to the the edges of the door and I can actually, actually feel cold air coming through. Anytime that you that you can sense that with your um, with your own senses, it's good to um, start addressing those with such measures. Um, Another uh, good tip for trying to find these little air leaks are to turn off lights during, um, during the day um, and look around on the exterior of the building, uh, minus the windows of course, and to see if you notice any cracks or any, air, any light shining through the envelope of the building. Um, a friend of mine had, was uh, doing an energy, energy walkthrough with um, an engineer and they went down into the basement and noticed with the lights off that there was light coming from um, a, an obscure corner of the basement. Well, it turns out there was a hole um, uh, around the foundation and that light was coming through. Well, that was a, definitely a spot for air and energy to be seeping out. So simple tricks like that can help identify wasteful air leaks. Moving on to Phantom load, so electrical devices. Um, phantom load, otherwise known as plug load or phantom power or standby power, is the energy that a, a device uses when it is turned off. That's right. Devices can um, still be draining energy when they're in the off mode, but still, um, but still plugged into the wall. Um, this is especially obvious for all of those gadgets with little lights on them. Um, and you may notice this, uh, you know, on uh, microwaves or, you know, on printers, on your computer, um, when you have to turn it off. Those are all, is, whenever you see a light, that means that it's drawing energy. And even your, um, your like, computer or your cell, cell phone chargers, those also drain energy, even though they was, um, do not have a light on them. Um, in the realm of computers, uh, they can drain a lot of energy over time. This graph indi indicates um, the cost of energy for five desktop computers, five L um, computer displays that are LCD monitors, and five computer dis displays that are the CRT, the big fat old monitors, how much energy they drain if they were left in the off, sleep, or on positions for the entire year. Um, so you can imagine what this graph would look like with the number of computers that you have in, in, your, um, in your building. So it's, it mu I mean, it's obviously not realistic that a computer would be left in the off position in the entire year as you know, computers are, are switched between off, sleep, and on throughout the year. But this, this shows how much energy and how, how much it costs for, um, for, that, for those types of technologies. For, you can um, first note that um, the LCD displays use a lot less energy than, um, than the uh, old CRT monitors um, and that le putting your, um, your computer in the sleep mode uses a lot less energy considerably than um, computers left in the on mode. So when you step out for a meeting, so that's you know, only an hour, you step out for lunch, um, it's good to put your computer to sleep so that you save a lot of energy, but you don't have to, you know, um, start up your computer completely from scratch. Um, all of your applications are still left in the same um, same position, so those are it's a it's a good option for saving energy um, in the short term when you leave your computer. Um, another thing to think about with phantom load is using power strips. 
uh, and plugging your computer into PowerStrip so it's easier for you to, tur to turn off your PowerStrip at the end of the day. Um, so you don't actually have to unplug, your, uh, unplug the computer and anything that's attached to it. Um, I know at the U of M, they, uh, the p green power police <laughs> came through and put the power strips on our desks um, so with little green signs on them that um, help us remember, uh, not only to remember to turn off the power strip, but it makes, it a, makes the barrier a lot, uh, it reduces the barrier for us to turn off the, our power strips because it's within easy reach, we see it every day, um, it's a lot more um, accessible than the power strips that would be underneath the desk. So that's another option that you may have. And then finally, um, think about all of the, the printers, fax machines, scanners, etc., that you have on in your office. First consider, are they on all day? Do you need them on all day? Um, it might be beneficial to uh, only turn on a printer when you need to print something. Um, not only does it save energy, but it also actually makes you expend energy a little bit more. Um, so that you know, gives you those few extra steps during the day to help you be a little healthier. So power on those, um, those machines only when you need them. And there are, of course, three um, excellent resources uh, for low carbon IT campaigns or you know, energy, efficiency, uh, energy efficient um, computing. So of course, Energy Star has um, has a great site. Uh, Climate Savers Computing also has some great tips, and then the Pollution Control Agency um, has um, done a lot in their building um, with regards to uh, IT uh, energy consumption, and so they've written up a case study of how it's gone in their building. Moving on to. have appliances, refrigerators, microwaves, you know, washers, stoves, coffee makers, etc. In, um, in our offices. Um, and over time these can of course drain a lot of energy. Consider, do you need the microwave to tell you what time it is? Do we, um, do we not have cell phones and computers and clocks telling us what time it is? So these types of appliances that you know are on all the time but we don't actually use them all the time um, they, we can put them on power strips um, too to reduce the amount of energy that they're using. Um, you can also downsize um, the number of appliances that you, that you have. Um, I know at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, uh, they condensed the number of refrigerators, refrigerators they have. Um, instead of having um, five floors of tiny mini re refrigerators, they um, upgraded to one uh, large refrigerator um, in a central location and were able to reduce their energy usage that way and they had few complaints um, from, the, from the move. Um, but one note with that, it's always good to communicate with the people that you work with that this is happening um, to get everyone's input before you make um, drastic uh, changes to, <laughs> to people's convenience. Uh, Another thing um, with uh, appliances is to, when you're ever uh, purchasing new appliances, is to look for this Energy Star logo. Um, the Department of Energy Energy Star um, uh, cam uh, program uh, certifies specific appliances that are high efficiency, so they are always good to have. Uh, and the last thing on this page is to utilize low flow faucet aerators and pre-rinse spray valves to reduce hot water use. So these two gadgets that you see um, on the left hand side in the center um, reduce the, um, the actual volume of water coming through uh, the, the nozzle, but they don't reduce the pressure uh, coming out. So they use more air instead of water, but you still get the same, um, same effect out of it. So for um, pre-rinse spray valves, um, they're pretty inexpensive, $30 to $40 each. 
um, and the faucet area is one to five dollars each and you look for the ones that have a, a low gallon per minute around 1.5 instead of the um, the norm the old normal which was 2.5 gallons per minute um, and what's great about these is that um, the Metro Cert um, restaurant energy efficiency program auditors found that there was a 53% decrease in the energy needed to heat and pump water um, using these low flow devices um, instead of the old devices and they have a payback of less than one year. So these are a great um, investment. Moving on to scheduling. Um, so this, this section is about effective scheduling in the building. Um, it's important to evaluate when people are in the building, what they're doing, and where they are in the building um, so that the building systems are not operating for just a handful, the handful of people in one area. Um, in Crosby Ironton schools, uh, they, they have effectively changed their, their cl uh, cleaning schedule with their, um, their building system schedule to line up um, in the right way so that when um, when the cleaning crew is there, their, um, their building systems are, are on in the right location, but not running in the locations where no one is located. Um, so it's good to um, dedicate certain zones of the building for the, the right people at the right times. And this is an example of a winter schedule. Um, as you can see, the building is, is closed on um, Saturday and Sunday. Um, and so the building is only heated to 50 degrees um, Fahrenheit and the lights are off. So this is a you know, base temperature so that none of the pipes freeze um, and all of the lights are off because no, none of the lights are needed because no one's there. Um, during the normal business hours from Monday through Friday, there's normal um, the building is heating, heated to a comfortable 68 degrees. Um, the security lights are on in the morning. Uh, and of course, all the hallway lights are on as well. Um, and then they've uh, scheduled it so that on um, Monday and Wednesday, when the, the cleaning crew is in, um, they clean in only specific areas. And only those areas are heated to a comfortable um, uh, setting. And the, and the lights are on where they need it. And then, of course, when um, there are specific events, like a basketball game, the gymnasium is heated to a comfortable, um, comfortable temperature, and the lights are also on for that time as well. And according to the Metro Cert uh, Restaurant Energy Efficiency Program auditors, um, they found out that by setting thermostats to 68 degrees during occupied times and 58 degrees during unoccupied times, in the winter time and in the dog days of summer at 75 degrees during occupied times and 85 degrees during unoccupied times, um, a, buildings can save 18% on their heating and cooling. And if you think about it, that's 18% for, for doing absolutely nothing. It costs you nothing in order to um, save 18%. It's just um, different scheduling. Of course, there are other um, behaviors that um, have opportunities that are no cost. Um, adding a delay to an elevator door can encourage stair use. Um, stop. Starting over. OK. Of course, there are many small ways in which we use energy. And of course, all of those small ways add up um, to major costs. Um, it's good to develop um, educational campaigns or competitions in order to um, uh, uh, incentivize these. Okay. Um, Of course, there are many small ways in, in which we use energy. And of course, all of these uh, th small things add up to large costs. Um, developing educational campaigns or competitions around uh, these practices are easy and can be lots of fun. 
use signage and in in-house uh, workshops to create awareness about energy intensive behaviors and use techniques which have been shown to work such as adding a delay to an elevator door to encourage stair use. A study from the 80s found that adding a second delay to the opening of an elevator door uh, um, caused a third of the riders to uh, take the stairs. And what's more interesting is that even when that delay was removed, that same third of, um, of previous riders continued to take the stairs. And this is most interesting um, because when people create new habits, they continue doing that habit. Um, you may consider with this, of course, with, um, with the automatic door openers as well. I need water. Okay, I'm tangled now. There are many small ways in which we use energy um, and that are commonly overlooked, but as the U of M campaign saying goes, it all adds up. Um, developing educational campaigns around um, these practices can be easy and fun. Um, stop. Okay. Use signage and in-house workshops to create awareness around energy intensive behaviors. I'm almost done. Okay. There are many small ways in which we use energy um, that are commonly overlooked, but as the U of M campaign saying goes, it all adds up. Use edu develop educational campaigns around these, um, around these practices, and it can be fun um, and educational at the same time. Uh, use signage and in-house workshops to create awareness about these energy intensive behaviors. Um, and then use techniques that have been shown to work, such as adding a delay to an elevator um, to encourage uh, stair use. It was shown in a study from the 80s that adding a second delay to um, the uh, elevator door opening um, caused a third of the ridership to um, migrate and use the stairs. And what's most interesting is that even when that delay was removed, that same third of riders uh, you still took the stairs. You may uh, also consider this using uh, for the automatic door openers as well. Um, other campaigns may be to promote um, double-sided printing um, and using both sides of the pr paper. Um, it, can, it encourages less printing overall, um, which is great. And then the final thing is to um, get rid of those nice to have but unnecessary personal energy consuming luxuries such as fish tanks, decorative lighting, coffee cup warmers, miniature waterfalls, lava lamps, etc. So be creative um, once you start. Um, identifying all of these energy um, consumers, it'll be really easy um, and you'll have fun uh, attacking those, those projects. And when you do implementing, uh, implement those uh, behavior changes, <laughs> you'll start noticing that it's very difficult, um, but it can be done. Um, it's most, it's vital to provide a supportive atmosphere to point out um, those people who have the, the fewest um, extra electronics um, and to award those people who are, who are um, consuming the less, least amount of energy and who are really taking steps to reduce their um, energy footprint, um, give them prizes and rewards for doing so. Um, and then, you know, at, at meetings, report on those people um, and, the, the over, and the organization's uh, accomplishments as well. Um, the other thing is to use norms to further your cause. Uh, just like people, it's become normal to recycle, um, make it normal to print double-sided. Uh, mention too that other buildings are working towards sustainability and your building doesn't want to be left, be left behind. Because people, as much as they want to be unique, they, um, they follow the crowd and um, want to be a part of that movement that is doing good things. Um, this realm of changing behaviors is pretty new. 
Um, and so uh, there is much resource sharing going on, especially at the community-based social marketing website. Um, this tool has articles and studies highlighting effective ways to make energy saving behaviors more the norm. Um, and um, in fact, they, they really heavily emphasize um, mentioning to your to employees and coworkers that you know doing these energy uh, efficiency behaviors is becoming the norm more and more people are doing it and that you want to be a part of the norm finally moving on to the um, the longer term more effort area of the best management practices of course you need to start with measuring um, doing a building evaluation that is more um, more in depth and more technical. So the first type is recommissioning, which is a systematic process to improve the operation of your building systems so that they actually meet your needs, and then only use as much energy as is really necessary to do so. Um, it's interesting um, that uh, Bruce Nelson at the Department of Energy Resources. Um, uh, he um, inspects and deals with a lot of buildings and uh, has seen that even new buildings have not, don't have um, their building systems working or operating correctly, uh, that they have fans put in backwards or valves <laughs> misinstalled. And um, so that even new buildings need to be um, recommissioned and reevaluated re to make sure that their systems are working correctly. And if you think about it, the longer that your building has gone without being um, with being evaluated or recommissioned, the more likely that the, the building is not meeting the needs of the current occupants. So how is this done? Well, it's a lot of engineering <laughs> that goes on. It's a lot of calibration um, and scheduling uh, of the systems, um, measuring air and water flows, looking at the ventilation, um, setting um, certain set points and resets, and then making sure every, the condition of the systems are, are in good order and that they're functioning well um, so that you know, fans are put in correctly, um, that dampers are swinging as they should, those types of things. Um, when you do want to do recommiss recommissioning, use in-house in experts. Use the talent and knowledge of your current maintenance staff as much as you can because you have that available, obviously. Um, but another thing you want to consider is uh, building that capacity of, of, your, of your current staff. Consider investing in um, building management training if you can. Um, it's important because uh, practices in the building industry are constantly evolving and um, that people need, your managers need to stay, um, need to stay up to what's, what new scientific evidence is telling us um, about building performance. And then this extra training helps um, ensure your proper energy management over the long term. So it is a good investment, especially um, if you have staff that are, will likely be with you for a long time. Um, and then just a side note, um, the utilities might actually help with the training costs. Uh, you just have to ask. Uh, Minnesota utilities have a gr good incentive to, um, for, for buildings to manage properly in terms of energy. So they are often very likely to help you build that capacity. There are, of course, um, lots of websites available um, as resources um, to give you more information on, on um, recommissioning. Um, Excel has a Buildings 101 uh, page. Energy Star also has um, a manual on recommissioning. And then Excel also find, uh, helps you, um, has a page that helps you find um, so recommissioning consultants and experts. Um, and if you don't want to use any of those, you can also talk to your, uh, your local utility about recommissioning because, as I said, they do have incentives to help you get such things done. The final type of building evaluation is an energy audit. This is the most common, um, uh, I guess, evaluation term that you hear, but it is actually one of the last types of evaluation that you, that you should investigate because it is the most uh, intensive, um, most complex, and most expensive, usually. Um, an energy audit is beyond a, a, re a recommissioning. It is um, the inspection, analysis, and survey um, by professional engineers or registered ar architects um, of the building energy flows and the building tightness. So they not only look at the building system, but they look at the building envelope. Um, 
And an example of this is um, they often look at the building envelope through a, an infrared camera or infrared image. Um, and this is just an example of those types of images. And it shows that um, you know, the red is where the heat is b being escaped the most, um, whereas the green and the blue, um, less heat is escaping. So that can help them identify where there are leaks in, or there is not enough insulation, um, or if windows need to be replaced, those types of things. To find um, energy auditors in your air area, you can go to the Energy Star website, um, and they have a list um, state by state of registered um, professional engineers and architects um, to do that. As far as capital improvement goes, um, the energy auditors will actually give you um, and give you some recommendations on what you need to do, whether it's more, more installation or a new boiler or um, replacing windows or um, maybe your next step is actually doing re um, some renewable energy projects. Um, and so you'll get a lot of your feedback from, your, um, from the energy audit. But these, um, these websites can, can help you um, through the financing of any of those types of uh, capital improvements. So um, Energy Star has some f um, inf information about the financial side through webinars, information, and support. Um, the Federal en Energy Management Program um, has some energy cost calculators. Uh, the Green Step Cities Public Buildings um, site has a list of uh, rebates and funding sources. And then the Desire website has a state-by-state -state database um, for all the like tax, um, tax breaks and other financial incentives for renewables and, and efficiency. So we've gone through the whole section of implementing best management practices, and we're ready for review. So re for an entire process review, um, you first want to start with um, developing um, and, and or updating your energy management strategy. So you gather your stakeholders, and you meet regularly, you set goals, and work really closely with this team to do all of these, the rest of this, um, all the rest of the tasks. So with this team, you'll enter and update um, your utility data um, uh, and building profile information into B3 um, to keep that system updated. And so it'll give you information about, tell, about your spaces with greatest um, savings potential, um, which is three, um, the third uh, task. Then um, now, when you know which areas have your biggest savings potential, then you can implement some best management practices in those chosen buildings. Uh, once you've implemented those practices, you can um, track that usage and evaluate the effect effectiveness of those practices um, using B3 and the, and the reporting uh, tools that I showed you on that. So um, once you've uh, evaluated that, you can start all over again. Um, with it with a new um, priority building. And if you have any questions, um, you're welcome to contact me, Katie at cleanenergyresourceteams.org. Thanks.